Today it's great to be here, and I just want to say, um, you know, from Antioch, a Bible Baptist, and from Pastor Bob Baird, uh, we just love you guys, love, love BBC, and uh, I, I did not get my undergrad degree from BBC, but I do have my master's degree from here, and uh, just uh, absolutely uh, love this campus. When we were thinking about where's Lauren going to go to school, um, we, we really looked at one other school besides BBC just because of proximity, and, and BBC was just... It. She fell in love with it at college days a year ago, and, uh, and, and she's here, and we're just really, really thankful for that and glad for that. Um, as, he said, as John said, I am the executive pastor at Antioch Bible Baptist Church, and one of the many responsibilities that I have as an executive pastor is to, uh, and I know this is just going to wow you, but to implement policy. And uh, isn't that exciting? Doesn't that just sound, just, it's just so, so much fun. Implement, enforce policy, ensure best practices, mainly in the area of finances. And uh, a couple of years ago, we implemented a lot of new financial policies. Um, we asked every employee to sign the policies. We asked every deacon, every finance team member, anybody in our church that handled money in any way whatsoever, uh, we asked them to, uh, to sign off on this. And a few people didn't like it, and we were accused of... Uh, being too corporate, too business-like uh, in the church. And my answer to that was, the Church of Jesus Christ ought to be totally above board in absolutely everything that we do. And if somebody has a problem signing a statement that says, I won't lie, cheat, or steal, that, that's a big problem. That's a big problem. Honestly, just uh, in my years of ministry, I've been flabbergasted at what I have seen in churches when it comes to finances at times. Uh, churches without budgets or no, no formal policies for handling funds or loosey-goosey or flippant attitudes towards spending the Lord's money. It's a big deal. You're here today because somebody's taken good money to have you here today and supported this school. And, and maybe you've gotten some scholarships from your church or whatever it might be. And uh, uh, when I first became an executive pastor, I took as my theme verse, and we're going to take a look at this passage today. So I'd invite you to open to 2 Corinthians 8. I took as my theme verse for what we do in the business office at Antioch Bible Baptist Church, 2 Corinthians 8, 21. And we're going to read the whole passage in context in a moment. But 2 Corinthians 8, 21 says, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And the word honest here comes from a Greek word, kolos, which has the meaning to regard with honor, honorable. Uh, to uh, bring honor. And the church of Jesus Christ should be honorable in all of its dealings, in the sight of the Lord and in the sight of men. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I don't believe we ought to be following the world. We shouldn't be following the world in a lot of ways. But if we don't get on board in some areas with what is best practices in our society, we're going to be looked down upon for the wrong reasons. And so... I just want to just say this as we jump into this passage. The cross and the message of the cross is offensive enough. There shouldn't be anything that comes out of our personal lives or our ministry that brings offense in a way that causes people to look down on the church for any other reason than the fact that we've preached the cross. And so as, as an executive pastor and leading uh, our church in areas of finance and uh, our deacons and our finance team and business meetings of the church, that type of a thing. This is a, a really big deal. And so as I started to think about what am I going to speak to you guys about, I just kept coming back to this, this theme verse that I've, that I've taken for my, for my ministry. And I want to read it in its context and talk a little bit about uh, what the Apostle Paul had set up and what he's meaning behind this verse. So would you start reading with me? Follow along as I read, starting in verse 16. 2 Corinthians 8, 16 says, But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is, is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not that only, but who also was chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. Avoiding this, that no man should bl uh, blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest things, not only the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. 
And we have sent with them our brother, whom we oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be, in, uh, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. <clears throat> Father, I just ask today that you take your word and use it in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. In 2009, the great crash was happening all around us and, and leaders from some of the major car manufacturers go to Washington, D.C. to plead their case in front of Congress. Uh, and that began the $63.4 billion bailout of the auto industry. And as I was thinking about this passage, that instance came to my mind because they didn't just send anybody to Congress. They didn't send the janitor sweeping the floor, and they didn't send a lineman that just put uh, nuts and bolts on the, on the vehicle as it went by. They sent the top dog uh, to plead their case. But just imagine with me, if you will, that they decided to send a guy by the name of Fred Johnson, who was a disgruntled employee, to go plead their case. And Mr. Johnson gets up the morning of the congressional hearing, and he's running late, and he comes slamming into Congress 15 or 20 minutes late. And when it's his turn to speak, all he could talk about was the fact that he was injured on the job, was never compensated, and how horrible it was to work for this company. That would do them a lot of good if that took place, wouldn't it? I mean, isn't it true that you've got to have the right person for the right job? You've got to have the right person in the right slot. And sending the wrong man to do this job would be more harmful than good. And there are a lot of tasks in the church that you've got to look at the people involved. And are you the right person? Is this the right person to do this job? Um, I want us to focus this morning on the fact that Paul chose three men very carefully to do the task that was being called for. In this passage, in this passage, we find three men of a certain quality that were going to do a good job that would be above board, above reproach in the eyes of the Lord and in the sight of men. I want us to focus on verses 20 and 21 for a moment where it says, avoiding this, that no one should blame us in the abundance which is administered by us, providing for those honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but in the sight of men. And in this particular work of finances in the church. This particular work, there we need to be totally above board, honoring Christ in all that we do to avoid criticism. And of course, we should strive to avoid, uh, uh, to, to honor Christ and to be above reproach in every situation. But I find it interesting in this passage that Paul chose to step out and say, in this area, we've got to be extra careful. In this particular area, we've got to be really above board. And there are times when the church is way more vulnerable to criticism than other times. And in this situation that they're talking about in this passage involved money. Lots and lots of money, perhaps significant contributions from churches all across the region that Paul was collecting to take to the saints in Jerusalem. It started at Antioch as Paul began his third missionary journey. It moved into the region of, uh, uh, of Asia Minor to Macedonia, across the Achaean Peninsula, eventually into Greece, and Paul was preparing to go into Jerusalem to take this gift that had been collected. You know, when you're talking about money, you're dealing with all kinds of dangers, all kinds of dangers. You've heard of misappropriations of funds and people mishandling things, and, and money lends itself to temptations of which a lot of people have fallen prey to. And in this passage, I was thinking about this delegation of people that's collecting these funds of the dangers that were, that were there and present that could, that could cause them to fall. Um, think about it. It's in a day where there's no banks. You don't just take a collection in a church and go deposit in the bank for somebody else to get electronically somewhere else. They're carrying these funds with them as they go. And I, and I thought about that, and I thought about the time that they were in, and thought about how Satan definitely wants to attack the church in any way he can. But if he can get the church and people in the church to mishandle funds, it's a big deal. And in this setting, one of the things that was involved here was the two parties involved, the Jews and the Gentiles. This was a very critical time in the, in the life of the church. And that there was a largely Jewish need in Jerusalem that was being met largely by Gentiles uh, in, in another region. 
And this was a time of transition with Judaism and paganism. And, and the Christ was bringing both Jews and Gentiles to himself. And they were learning how to mesh themselves together. It was a very critical time. Not unlike the situation in the civil rights era in our country when blacks and whites were that all the tension that was there learning to mesh themselves together. And uh, through the grace of Christ, both Jews and Gentiles were coming together. And the timing of this gift was just uh, a way. In verse 19 it says, and the declaration of your ready mind, the Gentiles were declaring, we believe the Jews are our brothers that have come to know Christ and we're going to prove it by this tangible gift. But imagine with me how things would go if something happened to the money. Imagine with me if the couriers were Gentiles, the Jews would have reason to accuse them. You didn't really want to help us anyway. Imagine if the couriers were Jews and something happened to the money, the Gentiles would say, well, you're not trustworthy. How can we uh, ever trust you? We gave this gift sacrificially and you're thieves and unworthy of our help. And the great divide that would take place in this fledgling church between that, that was meshing the Jews and Gentiles together and how critically important it was to have the right person in the right job. It would have created a huge gulf and crippled the advancement of the kingdom. There were several churches involved with this relief aid. The Macedonians, were told, gave of their poverty to this. So it was a big deal and potentially divisive and destructive impacts on the church if the right people were not chosen and the right thing did not happen. Folks, there are always opponents to the gospel. There's always opponents to the church. And our enemy is like that roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he wants to destroy the church any way he can. And, uh, and, and if something bad would have happened to these funds, if somebody would have mishandled it, it would have been ammunition by the enemy to level against the church. The apostles and churches involved had a choice to make. Who were they going to entrust to carry this gift? Who were they going to get? And the Apostle Paul tells us in this passage about three people that he chose to be his associates. And I was thinking about this at Baptist Bible College. I, I graduated from Faith Baptist Bible College in Ankeny, Iowa back in 1989. And, uh, and I can remember uh, being told this, and it, and it turned out to be uh, true in my life in a lot of ways. But a lot of, a lot of you sitting here today, your first ministry is, is going to be maybe in some type of a role of being subordinate to someone else. Um, you're going to be maybe a youth pastor or an associate or a, or a missions intern, or you're going to go and, and teach somewhere or whatever it might be, or you're going to be a, the wife of one of these folks. And you're going to put yourself in subjection under someone else. Now, some of you, you're going to go right out of the starting gates and you'll be a <laughs> senior pastor or a church planter, but a lot of times you leave Bible college and you voluntarily begin by placing yourself under the authority of someone else. And the Apostle Paul is looking now for good associates in this passage. Who can I trust? Who can I trust to do what I know needs to be done? And when I look in this passage, starting in verse 16, I see where it says that Paul talks about Titus. Thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. And I see, and as what I want to do with the rest of the message here, with setting it up about what's going on in the context, and I want to talk about these three men that the Apostle Paul chose as his associates. His, what are the characteristics of the guys that the Apostle Paul trusted to come alongside and do the job? And the first thing I see in verse 16 of Titus, uh, talks about Titus, I see a love for the body of Christ, a love for the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul said of Titus, look, church, when you know my heart for you, Titus has the same heart. Titus has the same heart for you that I have. A common concern for the well-being of the bride of Christ. Now, I'm an executive pastor, an associate pastor by choice. Uh, my very first ministry, I planted a church in Portsmouth, Ohio. Uh, 20 years ago. I know it was 20 years ago because they just celebrated their 20th anniversary and uh, had the privilege of being just a tiny part of that celebration. And then uh, I've also been a senior pastor in Iowa, and I've had my own staff to lead and all of that, and now I'm in a season where I have voluntarily placed myself under the authority of Pastor Bob Bear 
as the executive pastor of Antioch Bible Baptist Church. And so I'm always intrigued when I look in scripture and find examples of other men who have voluntarily placed themselves under the authority of someone else. And, uh, you know, here's Titus. He's willing to run errands for Paul. He's willing to do whatever Paul wants him to do to advance the cause of Christ. And when, you're a, when you've got a big name guy like the Apostle Paul and you're the run around guy, all right, sometimes it might make you feel about that small. But Titus had the, the ability to look beyond that and say, this is all for the cause of Christ. This is for the church. This is what I'm supposed to do. And if Paul wants me to do it, if Paul's going to do it out of love for these people, then I'm going to do that also. And so you can hear Paul's testimony of Titus Hart in verse 17 when he says he accepted the exhortation. So I, I extended the call, Paul says, and he accepted the exhortation. But look what it says at the end of that verse, of his own accord, he went unto you. So Paul says, I exhorted him to be a part of this, but he was willing to do it. He wasn't just, uh, you know, drafted to do it. He's doing it voluntarily. He's willing to take the initiative and do it. And so this love for Christ and his bride, the church, motivated him to do this. And I thought about this. When a young man falls in love with a beautiful woman, he, he doesn't have to be motivated to spend time with her. I can think back to whenever my wife and I, Tammy and I, were dating. I was a senior or excuse me, a freshman at Texas A&M University right out of high school. And I roomed in an apartment with three other guys, so we split the rent four ways. This is before the days of cell phones and free long-distance calls, okay? There were months that my long-distance phone bill talking to Tammy was more than my portion of the rent, okay? And just, I didn't need to be told, make her a priority, spend time. We didn't even have to talk, just knowing each other I was on the other end of the line, you know? Just, oh, wow. Anyway, <laughs> Titus was that way about the church. He loved the church. We see a second characteristic here of Paul's associates, all right, and that is a track record of faithfulness, a track record of faithfulness. Titus began his close work with Paul in Ephesus. He had been entrusted to carry the letters of the church like this one to Corinth. He was trusted to carry the interactions back and forth. We can tell from Scripture that there were more letters back and forth to Paul than that we have in the Bi uh, to Corinth than we have in the Bible. And Titus was entrusted to carry those letters back and forth and even to interpret Paul's heart to the church. Paul would write the letters, even disciplinary action that had to take place and entrust Titus to take that and interpret his heart. And this track record of faithfulness goes beyond just this instance in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Following Paul's Roman imprisonment, he held Paul on the island of Crete, Titus 1.5. In 2 Timothy 4.10, he was used later in life in the area of Dalmatia, which is modern Yugoslavia. When asked to help with the collection, he was enthusiastic. Now listen to this. I might say this a couple of times for you, but I want you to catch this. A willing and enthusiastic spirit coupled with faithfulness is a wonderful combination that invites people to trust you. A willing and enthusiastic spirit coupled with faithfulness is a fantastic combination. Invites people to trust you. And Paul, Paul trusted Titus. And Paul would later ask Titus for help. He said in, in uh, Titus 3.12, do your best to come to, be at, to me at Nicopolis. And along your way, meet the needs of those you meet. And Paul knew that he could trust Titus to do just that. Well, there's two other folk that are involved in this delegation. We're not given their names. We're not told who they are. Some have surmised maybe one of them was Luke. But in verse 18, it talks about a second person in this party. We have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel through all the churches. And so a third characteristic of Paul's associate is this. A good reputation is a faithful hard worker of the gospel. A good reputation is a faithful, hard worker of the gospel whose praise is in the gospel. That word praise there denotes the idea of commendation. And this man, whoever he was, was commended because he was a faithful, hard worker for the sake of the gospel. You know, it's been said, I, I've heard people say that there are good laborers and there are gospel laborers. You know, and I say that the church needs more of a combination of somebody who's working hard for the sake of the gospel. Just a hard worker. 
I, I, I just want to encourage you guys, just kind of an aside, going in, thinking about going into ministry, and if you're going to go in as an associate or whatever happens, be a hard worker. I, I tell you, I had a staff in, in, in Iowa, Council Bluffs, Iowa, where I pastored, and my youth pastor, I, I, I got this guy, thought he was going to be great, and this guy took track of every bit of his time and came to me one day and said, okay, I spend this, you know, about this many hours on Wednesday night with the youth group, and I spend this much time in church on Sunday, and, uh, and all of these he wanted to deduct from a 40-hour work week, and that's all the office hours he needed to keep that week. Guy, listen, if you're wanting a 40-hour job, it's not the ministry, okay? Be a hard worker. Don't keep track of time. Keep track of what there is to do and get after it. Don't neglect your family or anything like that. But be a hard worker. And the church needs this. The church needs this combination of hard work and laboring for the gospel. And this guy not even mentioned, his name's not even mentioned. We don't even know who he was. And there's a lesson in that because God knows your name. Nobody else has to know your name. He labored for the gospel. We're not even told how many people he led to Christ in this passage. We just know he was commended for faithfully working hard for the sake of the gospel. And he was trusted by Paul. And then just the last characteristic I give you is out of verse 22. It talks about a third man. We sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent. The fourth characteristic is just known to be diligent. Diligence. Diligence is the earnest, conscientious application of our energy to accomplish what we've undertaken. And when we're diligent, we pay careful attention to detail and we seek everything we can with all that we are to seek the results that we're looking for. Diligence means we continually work towards our goals, making use of whatever resources are available. We stay focused on the task at hand. We don't give up. We're diligent. And I think that describes the person Paul was talking about here. That's faithful and entrusted with this gift. Let me just leave you with this, this thought. The advancement of the kingdom happens. The advancement of the church happens when God's people, the church, takes the responsibility of carrying out God's work in such a way that they take great pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but in the sight of men as well. And many of you here, as I said, are, going to, are planning to be in ministry of one sort or another. And I just want to encourage you, whether you're going to be a leader, a layman someday, whatever it is that God calls you to do, I encourage you to demonstrate a love for the church. Just fall in love with the church. I know this weekend is the line of demarcation. You've got to be committed to a church by this weekend, right? I just want to encourage you, if you're a freshman especially, get involved in a church and stay there all four years you're here. Well, through the ups and the downs and the valleys and the mountains, stay there and prove yourself faithful. Develop a proven track record of faithfulness. And then cultivate a reputation of being a hard worker for the gospel and prove yourself to be diligent. I pray that it can be said of us as as it's said in this passage at the end of verse 23, and it talks about these people, that their lives were for the glory of Christ. May your life, may my life, be honest and honorable in the sight of the Lord, in the sight of men, and may our lives bring glory to Christ. And if they have anything against you, may it not be for falling in the area of finances or falling morally in some fashion, May the only thing this world have against you is that you are a hard worker for the cause of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your, your word.